What's up everybody? My name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesia resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. In this video, I'm going to be sharing with you what I tell my patients as I'm getting ready to give them general anesthesia for surgery. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribe to the channel. Let's get started. Before we get too far, let me give you a sense of what the patient actually goes through before getting anesthesia for surgery. The very first thing that'll happen as far as the anesthesiologist is concerned is that I'll go ahead and place an IV, typically in the hand or in the arm. Sometimes this is done by a nurse or another healthcare professional, but at a major academic teaching center in the United States, it's pretty common for an anesthesia resident to be the one placing the IV before surgery. Once the IV is placed and the nursing staff and anesthesia and surgery has all spoken with the patient, then we go back into the operating room and typically I'll disconnect an IV for transport and then I reconnect it when I get back to the operating room and I just want to make sure that it works. So that's the first thing that I test when we get back into the operating room. All right, Mr. Patient, first thing we're going to do is get that IV tubing reconnected and make sure that still works. Yeah, sure thing, Doc. Make sure that IV still works so you don't have to do that again. Great, running beautifully. So next up, I'm going to get some monitors put on you. This next part is nothing official, but at least in my own head, I break down the pre-anesthesia components into three categories. So the first one is putting on monitors, the second one is called pre-oxygenation, and the third part is called induction. For every procedure that has anesthesia with it, I always place at a minimum the following monitors, starting with a blood pressure cuff, which goes anywhere between once every three minutes and once every five minutes. I place EKG leads at a minimum three, but typically I place five of them. Then this device, which is called a pulse oximeter, which allows me to see oxygenation in the patient's blood and also gives me their heart rate. Another monitor that I place is a thermometer, which can be placed in a variety of areas on the body, and I usually put that on after the patient's already gone to sleep. The other monitor that doesn't exactly get connected to the patient per se is a CO2 monitor, which is connected to whatever type of breathing device that I'm using. Once I've got all my monitors placed and I've made sure that they're working well, I move along to pre-oxygenation. Preoxygenation is a really important process of essentially filling up the patient's lungs with 100% oxygen. So you may know that the air that we're breathing is actually mostly nitrogen. It's about 78% nitrogen. So another term for the process of preoxygenation is called denitrogenation, which means removing all the nitrogen from the patient's lungs and having the patient's lungs be filled as close as possible to 100% oxygen. So if I can get to 90% oxygen in the patient's lungs, that's an excellent level for getting ready to start general anesthesia. After I've completed pre-oxygenation, which typically takes anywhere from two to three minutes, then I'll go ahead and induce general anesthesia. So the induction of anesthesia is an extremely important time where we're giving a very carefully calculated mix of medications in order to safely get the patient to sleep. The kinds of things that I'm thinking about as I'm inducing general anesthesia include the patient's heart rate, their blood pressure, because often the anesthetic agents that we use can decrease a patient's blood pressure, so we have to be very mindful of that. I want to make sure that their oxygen levels are adequate, I want to make sure there aren't any concerning changes on the EKG, and I want to make sure that there aren't any sorts of indications of an adverse drug reaction, that could be changes in skin color, that could be changes in some of the settings that I'm seeing on my ventilator. So all of these things I'm being mindful of as I'm inducing general anesthesia. What the patient experiences is typically maybe some relaxation if I've decided to give a drug called Versed or midazolam to relax a patient several minutes before giving general anesthesia. To induce general anesthesia, there are a number of different medications that we can use, but the one that I'd say is by far the most common is called propofol. And propofol is a medication that usually kicks in within about 10 seconds and the patient will have the experience of losing consciousness and the next thing they know, they're waking up, the surgery's all done, and they're probably not going to start forming new memories until they're in the recovery room, although patients are usually awake and responsive once we have stopped the anesthesia and woken them up in the operating room themselves. But typically that's not something that people even remember after surgery anyways. So at this point, I'm about five months into my training and I've administered roughly 250 anesthetics, of which approximately 200 of those have been general anesthesia. Now there are different levels of anesthesia, but for the most part, when people think about going under for anesthesia, they think about general anesthesia, which means not being conscious, not making memories, not being aware of any pain from surgery. So this is the type of anesthesia that I'm focusing on in this video. 
So I'd say out of those 200 general anesthetics that I've given, probably about 90% of them fall into what I'd call the usual category. And the usual category is a patient who may be a little bit nervous. It's very normal to be nervous before surgery, um, but they're not overwhelmingly nervous. They're maybe talkative, not overly talkative, but we have conversation and I like to chat about all sorts of stuff before surgery and especially if that helps them get their mind off surgery. Anyways, for the usual patient, we get into the operating room, we connect the IV, put on all the monitors, do the pre-oxygenation with the mask, and then induce general anesthesia. And it's not really anything for me to write home about, although I can definitely appreciate that it can be a very nerve-wracking experience for patients. Next up is the funny patient encounter. And that might be because the patient's cracking jokes. Occasionally I'll have a patient who's just hilarious and making jokes all the time. Or sometimes I think I'm funny, so I try to crack jokes. Anyways, one time I had a patient who wanted to count backwards, and that's not something that I instruct patients to do, but this patient was really excited about it, so I let them go ahead and do that. Doc, is this the point where you tell me to count backwards? Oh, well, that's not actually something that we ask patients to do. Sorry to disappoint. Oh, well, can I just count backwards anyways like they do on TV? Uh, sure, yeah, you can go ahead and count backwards from 10. You probably won't make it to 5, honestly, but, uh, yeah, go ahead. You can knock yourself out. Oh, yeah? Well, I got a liver of steel. I bet I can count backwards from 10 twice before I fall asleep. Uh, sure thing. Go ahead and try. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one. I'm impressed. But definitely the funniest part of this experience was actually in the recovery room after the surgery happened because I told the patient that they counted backwards from 10 twice and they didn't believe me. And not only did they not believe me, they aggressively did not believe me. They went so far as to accuse me of being a liar and it was getting a little intense in the recovery room. You're a liar, man. I don't believe you. You are full of it. You are lying to your patient, man. Anyways, once I made sure the patient was feeling well and I signed out to the nurse in the recovery room, I went ahead and left without trying to fully convince the patient of what had happened. The other thing that I used to think was funny was telling patients to just let me know when they're asleep once I started inducing general anesthesia. I thought that was really clever and sometimes a nurse in the operating room might laugh a little bit. But then I had this one patient who was actually a pediatric patient. Alrighty, buddy, why don't you let me know when you're asleep? I bet that's not the first time you've used that joke. Uh, you're right, but it's probably the last. Yeah, so that was fairly shameful. After that, I stopped using that joke. Sometimes I get patients who are just really talkative. They might be really talkative because that's just how they are normally, or maybe they're really nervous about surgery, so that makes them talkative. These patients do not care what I'm doing to them or whether I'm listening to them. They just keep talking. Yeah, sometimes I like to watch videos on YouTube, but I haven't really seen any good videos on YouTube, especially in the medical profession. There aren't really people who are releasing good videos on YouTube. Yeah, and I was yeah to okay, all right, we're gonna go ahead and connect that IV. About it. But I couldn't find anybody who was good with anesthesia, so I don't know. But especially, once I give this relaxing medication, midazolam, the talkers really start talking. Uh, and I love Mount Sinai Hospital, and I've been feeling so good, especially since you gave me that shot a couple minutes ago. And I wonder if I can get some more medication. Like, I'd say, Doc, what's the name of that medication you gave me? And I just love being inside Mount Sinai Hospital right now. Personally, I'm not a fan of Okay, medication. yeah, that's nice. Good, um, yeah, can you go ahead and start breathing this skin, oxygen and for me? Not really... And to be honest, that's totally fine, because as long as they're safe and they're comfortable, then I'm happy, and they can talk all they want until the general anesthesia kicks in. Okay, time to sleep now. Next up is the extremely nervous patient, and I can totally empathize with this. I have had anesthesia myself. It was a concerning experience to me, although everything went very well, and so I can completely understand if somebody is very nervous about their experience with anesthesia. One of the wonderful things about being an anesthesia resident is that I can do something to help out with that nervousness. So one of the ways that I can help patients is pharmacologically, either with midazolam or some other medications that help patients relax. And the other way that I like to help someone relax is to just turn on music. And I usually carry a speaker with me so I can have music in the operating room either before or during surgery. So when I can, I do like to ask patients what they'd like to listen to as they're getting ready to undergo anesthesia in their surgery. Hey, Mr. Patient, you feeling okay? Yeah, Doc, I'm real nervous right now. Sure, that's completely understandable and normal to feel that way right now. Would it be helpful if I put on some music for you? Sure, yeah, some music would be great. 
Yeah, here, let me just go ahead and pull up some music, and uh, what kind of stuff would you like to listen to right now? Yeah, I mean, the music that always calms me down the most is underground European rave music from the late 90s. Oh, yeah, I, uh, I think I can dig some of that up. The only thing about this technique is that once the surgeon walks in after anesthesia's been induced and they hear this music playing over the speaker, I do get some funny looks sometimes, depending on what the patient picked out. I do put on a lot of reggaeton in my operating rooms, and nobody's ever told me to turn it off, so I'm just going to keep doing that. The last type of patient that I actually haven't encountered that much of is a pediatric patient. So we have formal pediatric rotations throughout residency. I have not done mine yet. Um, I have done some cases with pediatric patients, but just a handful at this point. And I have to say that with kids, and especially with young kids, I really have no idea how their brain works and what I can do to help them feel relaxed and at ease and let them know everything that's going on during the process. I don't want to be that stuffy, non-fun doctor behind a mask, so I usually try to find ways to make pediatric patients feel at least a little more comfortable. I have no idea what kids actually find funny or comforting, so my approach has been to pretty much just dissociate reality and try and come up with things that may be entertaining somehow, and I found that it actually works. Okay, now I'm gonna put this clippy on your finger that all the cool kids are using, and if you put it on just right, it'll light up a red light and then make the beeps go beep, beep, beep. Whoa, do you smell that? It smells like bubble gum. One of the best things that I've seen to keep a kid's mind occupied, especially as we're getting ready to do the pre-oxygenation and a mask is going over their mouth, is they make this special concentrated bubble gum flavor that you can just drop onto the mask so the mask smells like bubble gum. I love bubble gum. Do you want to smell the bubble gum? The bubble gum smells great. Maybe I'll just start bringing bubble gum flavor concentrate into the operating room for all surgeries, because who wouldn't like that? Well, that wraps up this video, and if you have any feedback, and especially any ideas for funny things I can tell patients before I induce general anesthesia, I'd really appreciate it if you left it in a comment below. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.